Talent Motor Coach. Our guest this morning is Honda Performance Development President Art St. Cyr. Art, thanks for making time for us this morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Hello. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, I think we want to start just by uh, speaking about the, uh, the accident that happened here Monday that affected Honda driver James Hinchcliffe. I know you've been to see him twice in the hospital. Um, obviously, he's in all of our thoughts at this point. Just give us an update on uh, your personal impressions of, of his condition at this point. Yeah, it's, actually a, it's actually a little hard for me to talk about, it, honestly, because it's uh, in my time here at HPD, it's the, the first real serious accident that uh, we've been involved in. And uh, you know, I want to thank the uh, Homatro safety crew, honestly, for the, uh, the wonderful work they did um, to get him stabilized and, and get him to the hospital. So I saw him right after the accident in the, in the ICU, and I saw him again two days ago. He got transferred to his uh, regular room, and uh, it's amazing the difference in uh, his condition. He was, you know, of course, when I see him in the ICU, he's a little uh, groggy at that point. But uh, you know, when you transfer him to his regular room, he's doing amazing. You know, he's joking, he's cracking jokes, which is pretty amazing considering the, uh, the seriousness of the situation. But uh, we're looking forward to getting him back. You know, that's all he can talk about is, is he can't wait to get back in the car. So sometimes you wonder what these race car drivers are thinking, right? But uh, you know, our, our thoughts and prayers are with him, and, and uh, we're we're just happy that he's uh, doing all right. Thanks, Art. Um, I think next we want to talk about the way the month has evolved, um, specifically referencing decisions that were made here last Sunday that affected the qualifying process. Um, I know that um, we haven't really had the opportunity to take credit for the work we've done by demonstrating it on the racetrack, but I know that you have some numbers and some figures that you want to show folks this morning related to all the prep work we did before we put our Super Speedway kit on the track. So uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Okay, well that, that's kind of the elephant in the kitchen, right? You know, talking about the uh, the issues that we had in qualifying last week. Um, as TE mentioned, I think uh, the biggest unfortunate thing is we spent a lot of time working on the, uh, the those arrow kits, especially the, the Speedway arrow kits. And, uh, you know, we feel like that uh, we were affected more than, than we expected to be affected by the rules change that happened. Um, we put a lot of effort into making sure that our cars were as safe as possible. I mean, obviously we're, we're in a sport where we're pushing the edge of our technical capabilities, so there, there's never a 100% guarantee, but uh, I asked our partners to, to put together a, a list of the, some of the things that, that we did to ensure the stability of our car are as safe as humanly possible. I mean, obviously, if you look at the designs of our car, a lot of our designs were brewed from our vast experience in sports car racing, where they have a lot of stability requirements. So things like the, uh, the, the big fin on our engine cover, the end plates on our uh, rear wings, the side the design of the side pods, all of those were designed with stability in mind. And, and actually, if you give me a second here, we, we actually had some numbers of uh, how much work we did on stability. So prior to homologation, we did uh, 1,144 individual CFD runs that focused specifically on stability. Again, this is using our knowledge of sports car and the, the stability requirements there, that's how we base it. That's why you see a lot of the design cues are very similar to what are there in the sports car. But each of those 1,100 runs took, takes three hours to mesh and six hours to run those simulations. So when you add all that up, it's uh, 3,852 hours of meshing and about 10,746 hours of computer time. So if you break that down into CPU hours, that's 2 million 59,200 CPU hours. That's just analyzing stability cases. So we think that that you know, as much as technologically possible, we developed a vehicle that was 
better in just about every aspect from a stability standpoint than the DW12 that it replaced. So in some cases, you know, the issues that we had last week, uh, we didn't think from our perspective that we needed to go to, to the extremes that was uh, imposed on us. However, for the good of any car, right, we didn't want to park the cars or do anything like that. Right? But this is, you know, the old cliche, it doesn't matter where you start, it's where you finish. So we agreed to go ahead with qualifying under those situations where we had, uh, were forced to put parts on the car that, that were designed specifically for race conditions that were not appropriate for qualifying situations. Things like our winglets that we had on there that, uh, you know, necessarily add drag in a situation where you don't need that. But uh, again, we think we have a very good race car. We expect to challenge for the win on Sunday. You know, and as TE said, you know, we're just really disappointed that we weren't able to take credit for the work that we did um, based on the situations that we had. So look ahead a little bit further to Sunday. Um, what kind of a race are you expecting? Uh, we've got 17 entries. Um, I'm just kind of wondering from an HPE standpoint how you're expecting the data play out. But the only thing that I've learned in this, my time here in racing is that no matter what your plan is, by the time lap one is over, your plans are pretty much out the window. Um, but we do expect, you know, hopefully, common sense prevails in the early part of the races, which happens in the last few years when we have the first half of the race been pretty tame. And hopefully that will be the same this year. Uh, we do expect tire wear to be a really key uh, influence on this race. Uh, we expect fuel economy to be a big influence on this race. Uh, so a lot of the characteristics that we've designed into our car, things like you know, better fuel economy on our cars. You know, we have the ability to put a lot of downforce in our cars, so hopefully we can manage tire wear. So um, we expect it to be a very strategic race as typical. We expect it to be fairly fast. And uh, you know, we just want to make sure that we're there at the end when the, uh, when the final sprint for the finish is. I think most of you know this, but I have to put my motorsports PR hat on and just inform those of you who may not that Honda is chasing its 11th win in 12 Indianapolis 500 from Sunday. With that, we will open it up to questions from the audience. Patrick. Uh, in all the stability testing, how much was done in yaw in reverse? Was reverse actually a test testing point on purpose for you guys? Uh, the question is whether yaw and reverse testing was conducted as a part of all our stability testing. So, yes, so, so we did a lot of testing in yaw, yaw stability. Again, that is the main reason for the uh, the big engine cover that we have and also the end plates is, is mainly for yaw stability. Um, what we found in our simulations is actually the, the 135 degree case is the most likely takeoff scenario. So uh, we did a lot of simulations at the 135 degree case. Since Elio's incident last week, uh, we have done an, an additional 60 runs, 60 CFD runs and counting, which counts for about 110,000 CPU hours on that, to, but that we have done more studies at the 180 degree case and also some uh, elevated cases as well going backwards. So yes, we have to do care to, to, to at least try and study those situations. Do you follow it up, Patrick? Yeah. Do you think you were successfully able to prove to IndyCar that you were okay? The question is if we thought we are successfully able to prove to IndyCar that our package was stable. So the, the, the answer is I, I think I think we were able to prove to IndyCar that that our design was inherently stable. However, we, given the situations that we had last week, I understand their concern because you know obviously it's motor racing. So you can never guarantee that the unexpected won't happen. 
So, but uh, I think that uh, overall IndyCar is, is satisfied with the work that we've done and, and stability for our cars. Stephanie. Did that satisfaction come before or after last Sunday? question is whether the satisfaction came before or after last Sunday. So I'm going to try and not get myself in trouble on this one. <laughs> But uh, like I said, I, I feel that, that we have demonstrated that our car is, is safer than the DW12 that preceded it in just about every race situation. We explained that to IndyCar beforehand. I think they believe what we said, but I understand for the good of the sport, we have to make sure and do everything we can to guarantee we don't have cars flying. So. Wolfgang, start with one question, please. Only <laughs> one? Uh, you said that <laughs> this aero stuff you learned or you took something from your sports cars, if I understand it correctly. In principle, for future development, can you do this aero stuff testing on a sports car and switch it over to an Indy car or is it not possible? The question is about transferable aero kit technology between our sports car program and the Indy car program. So I think the answer is that you know, every class of cars are different, but absolutely, I, I think not only can we do it in the future, I think we did it right now with these cars. So, you know, if you look at our ARX series, a lot of the design features that you see, you know, the, the, the big wings and those types of things are exactly transferable from one platform to the other. Now, closed wheel race cars versus open wheel race cars are inherently different aerodynamically so you can't test the whole package and honestly the way that the, the design is done you know, you, you, you're modeling airflow from the very front leading edge of your front wing all the way back to the back so the fact that you have completely different styles of vehicles I think it makes it hard to be able to test on a sports car but I think concepts I think transfer very well from one series to another Mark uh, question, um, IndyCar has said that they want to work work up to breaking the track record here. Um, have you done the simulations as to what that's going to take in terms of horsepower or aerodynamics, or haven't you got there yet? With regard to IndyCar's wish to work toward breaking the track record, specifically at the 100th running next year, have we done any simulation work in that regard yet? The simple answer to your question is no. However, to, to, to say that we don't have an idea of how much better we have to go, it would be a little bit of a misnomer. So, you know, here it's all about horsepower versus drag, right? So, you know, you can get there from many different ways. You know, you can, if you have a more powerful engine or you have less drag on the car, so it's a com the reality of it is a combination of the two. Up until now, we really focused on, A, making the car as safe as possible, which I think we've demonstrated that that, that was a key design criteria when we started developing this car. Um, and be trying to make the car go as fast as possible. So, you know, this is this kit that we have right now is, is the, the best we were able to do in the time frame that we had. Um, again, we think we did a very good job on this one. Obviously, the engine gets better every year. The aero kit will get better every year. Um, I think we know what it can take, but with the rules changes, it's hard for us to predict when and how that would actually happen. Ray. Yeah, what difference can you expect, if any, that aerodynamics will have on the gas mileage between the Honda's and the Chevy's commitments? The question is, regards uh, what difference aerodynamic improvements, enhancements might make on fuel mileage as it relates to both Honda's and Chevy's during the race. Well, I can't speak for the other side as to what their fuel economy is going to be. I mean, I think we demonstrated in you know, even as recently as the uh, the road course, the Indy road course, that our fuel economy was, was actually pretty good. Um, and of course, just in terms of drag, right, the, the aero kits are going to have a direct impact on how good or how poor, well, I shouldn't say poor, right, but but how good or how better <laughs> the, the, the fuel economy is on, on that one. So depending on how much downforce you run, it will affect your fuel economy. We, our, our aero kit has the, the flexibility designed in it to have lots of downforce. 
So obviously, if we go in a, in a max downforce situation, we'll get much worse fuel economy than at the end of the race we're really trying to trim out. So I would expect that you'd see kind of a, a range of fuel economies um, on the track, depending on how much downforce the teams are running. Brent. What, what is Honda done to try and explore the, you know, the causes of, of the interlips accident and perhaps how you can help teams ensure that that can't happen? question relates to James Hinchcliffe's accident and what Honda has done to research the causes and possible solutions. So it's a very interesting situation because the cars right now are made up of the fundamental Dallara chassis and the Honda aero kit and the Honda engines. So the, the parts that we're talking about, the suspension, is actually a Dallara part. So we have given our support to IndyCar and said we, we, will, we can help them with anything that they want to do. Fundamentally, they have been working with Delara right now to look at the Delara parts and how to improve those parts. Um, so far, the only thing that, that, that we've done is help in communication with our teams, but uh, Delara has taken the lead on trying to uh, clarify the fatigue limit of, of their parts on their chassis. There's nothing you can do with all your computer modeling capabilities or anything that maybe needs in the direction or provide data. Like I said, we, we've been offering it since since the beginning, so we're waiting for a specific request from IndyCar, and we have not received that yet. Wolfgang. Yeah, next question. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned simulation. Uh, how realistic is your simulation to the real world, the car on the racetrack? Is the car exactly doing with your error kit what you have simulated, or was there some untouched areas? How realistic? are our simulations when they're translated to actually putting the car on the racetrack? So I'm going to answer that question in a couple parts. So in simulation, obviously everything is perfect, right? The, the, the tolerances are zero. You know, the, there's really no aeroelastic impacts on that. Um, so necessarily, the, the CFD model is, is an ideal situation. So we have, the next step is a much more controlled environment, which is the wind tunnel. And what we found is that the actual wind tunnel results are very similar to our CFD and simulation results. So as far as the correlation of that, it's actually very good. Now when we get onto the actual racetrack, there's a lot of other factors in there. there there's crosswinds, there's buffeting from other cars. So there are some factors that you can only determine on the racetrack. So, as far as answering your question, I, I think that, that as far as we're able to measure, the things we're able to measure, it behaves very similar to what we expected. However, there's always some unknown and some dynamic situations that you'll get on a racetrack that can't be modeled. Take a couple of final questions, Mark. Yeah. Um here at Indy, it seems like the Hondas are pretty competitive with the Chevys. The speeds are very close. And I think you've said that you've focused on the oval on the oval package first and foremost. But on the road courses, at least so far this year, the Chevys seem to have, have a little bit of an edge. Do you guys plan on making any changes to your road course package this year, using tokens from next year and applying them this year, or do you feel your packages are going to be okay? question has to do with whether or not we're planning imminent changes to our road course kit um, because of what appears to be a competitive imbalance with Chevy. So first off, you're right that, that we designed our kit around the super speedways. So the parts that can't change, things like the engine cover, things like the side pods, those were designed first and foremost to be most effective here in the speedway. So we had to, that was our kind of our base platform for our road course. Now, with our road course performance up till now, you know, obviously we want to have better results, but we are working to within the rules to make changes as quickly as possible. So, so we do expect to have the improvements this year uh, on our road course kids. Mark Linden. You satisfied with the amount of track testing that's made available to you to qualify? You satisfied with the amount of track testing time that's made available to you to qualify? 
the, the, I don't think either of us it, got the question no, no, mark. I'm sorry. Well, the, 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 the question was, was, are we satisfied with the amount of track testing we had before qualifying? So the, the, the simple answer to that is, is that the more track testing you do, the more you know the kit. You know, it, it, it was even. You know, it's very, you know, both manufacturers have the same number of test days, so we both have the same handicaps. Um, I think it's safe to say that, especially in light of what happened, we would have liked to have had more test days, but those were the rules that we knew going in. So to, to say that, that we should have had more or not had more is kind of second guessing what we had planned from the beginning. We'll take Stephanie and then Patrick. Okay, uh, then we'll then we'll take Patrick and wrap up. Alright. Okay. Ray and Ray Hall. Ray Hall Letterman is currently your your best performing team. Are you surprised by that? Um, in light of Andretti Autosport not being where I if they were to move up, would that help your competitive balance? For some reason that, that seems to be one of your biggest handicaps. Your teams aren't performing where they need to. I think that was loud enough, and I just assume not repeat that question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, we have some work to do with, with our kids. You know that that I think that you know with the the Ray Hall team, you know that, that we were able to show that that we can be fast, right? But we have some work to do to try and improve our kids to make it more consistent for all of the way all of our teams want to run the cars, and we're working towards doing just that. Because Brand James always has to have the last word, we'll take the final question. <laughs> Even though it's early and this is an unusual oval, you've had to deal with some changes. Have you gotten a sense of how your kit's going to stack up against the ship to get into more the whole part of the season? The question has to do with a sense of how our oval kit is going to stack up against Chevy's. Yeah, I, I'm very confident, actually, the way that, that our car races. You know, it's hard to tell what teams are doing uh, during the, the practice times, but uh, you know, like I say, we have a lot of adjustability, a lot of flexibility to in our kids to try to uh, adapt to the situation that, that's on the course, that's on the on the track. That I think is a advantage that we have over, over our competitors. Um, so I guess my answer is yes. I'm, I'm confident that, that we'll be okay. We'll just, we think our engine power is there. We think our, our kit is designed properly to, to, to give us the tools we need to be competitive in this race. It seems like a good note to wrap up on. Thank you all very much for making the time to be with us this morning. Art, thanks for your time. Thank you all. Uh, let's go out and win the 500.